So passionate about it. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm actually the like meeting with him over Germany. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. I like Edgar. He yeah. brought me chocolate that day. He's like, oh, for hosting. <laughs> I was like, thank you, Edgar. Nice, nice to be appreciated. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's great. Oh, that we got some good. Oh, see, talking about Edgar. <laughs> Did he show up? He's right there. Oh. Hey, he always has his camera. Nice. Do you, do you know how you met the date for that ceremony? I will. I don't, but I'll get it for you. And um, I'll have one headphone in. So when the break happens, I'll come in and talk about it. Sure. Or maybe I'll even drop it in the chat so everybody knows. We'll do that. Okay. I'll drop it in the chat. Thanks so much. I know it's sometime next week. I want to say Friday, but don't quote me. Don't. Yeah, because I, I believe they said the 29th. Don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, it sounds about right. <laughs> Are you guys graduating? I'm actually a sophomore. Okay. I'm a sophomore. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a little more ways to go. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you think you're going to get a board or do you want to weave it away? Yeah. We'll leave it just in case. Yeah, we'll leave it just in case. Yeah. Look at the marker. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. All right, I'll let them know if they're not over. All right, guys, in Zoom and in person, thanks for coming. Remember to raise your hand or uh, type it in the chat, and Jeffrey will wave our presenter down today, Dominique. Um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, put them in the chat. And yeah, have a great session. Thank you. All right, guys, I'll put it in the chat. Thank you. So, good morning. My name is Dominique Parkreeves. Happy Earth Day, first of all. So it's fitting that today we're going to talk about sustainability in the built environment. Um, I thought we would start with, you know, some career chat. I want to tell you, you know, how you go from being an LMU grad from 2004 from this very school um, to all the different, you know, ups and downs that I've had that have led me to be the director of sustainability now for American Realty Advisors which is one of the largest privately held um, private equity investment managers in the United States. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about my story. I want to hear about you guys. I definitely want this to be interactive. I have hundreds of slides that we probably won't get through today, but we'll just um, you know spend the next couple hours hopefully getting your questions answered about sustainability, ESG, what's happening, um, in the markets, what's happening in terms of climate risk, how investors are um, having their interests peaked um, around these very issues as we speak, and kind of what the future looks like for sustainable real estate. So um, I grew up in Orange County, uh, Mission Viejo. If you guys are familiar, Mission Viejo High School graduate, was an editor, and um, I don't know if that had something to do with my interest in real estate it was something I always knew I wanted to do as my profession. Um, I, I say that because if you've been to Orange County, driven through Orange County, lived in Orange County in the last 30 years, you've seen it change substantially thanks to the Irvine Company and a myriad of other developers, whether it be residential, commercial, um, life sciences coming, uh, retail. I mean, you've got, you've got it all. So I spent a lot of weekends uh, growing up, not just going to the beach, but going to open houses, walking model home communities, um, and watching Orange County take off. Um, so, you know, here we go. It's the year 2000. I have to figure out where am I going to go to college because I grew up in a family where you go to college. There's no, there's no community college. There's, there's no other path. Um, my parents are both teachers, and so. It was one of those things that, like, you knew your path that you were on. Um, that can be a lot of pressure, but, you know, looking back on it today, I'm like, all right, that was, <laughs> thanks, mom and dad, that was good. Um, so, of course, went through the whole college search process, selected Loyola Mary now, because probably the very same reasons that you said it's come. Um, it's a great place to get a well-rounded education. The business school is fantastic. Uh, students are happy here. It's a 
community that is really close and tight knit. You're in gorgeous, sunny Los Angeles. And so you have access to kind of the best of everything. So um, I don't know if any of you have been in touch with Fred Kisner. I took a bunch of his entrepreneurship classes um, when he was here and kind of had launched that program. And I always feel like the LMU like open education prepares you for whatever you're going to do next. Um, if it is real estate, you're going to know how to do all the you know finance and all the math that you need to know how to do on your pro formas. If it's management, if it's sales, whatever path you take in real estate or in business, um, I think you're well served by your undergrad or your master's. But so um, anyway, I wanted to talk about career stuff. So I graduated in 2004 um, with the bachelor's in business administration. And of course, like you get to that senior year and you're like, okay, uh, need to get a job. You know, I didn't want to move home. So I'm like, all right, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm going to get out there in the world of IoT. Um, but of course, you know, I, I wanted to do real estate. So what was there out there in 2004 for like a recent graduate? And so uh, I think a theme of my profession is getting jobs through friends and through your uh, networks of people that you interact with, know, study with, play with, you know, go out with, whatever it is. So I had a friend at USC who told me about Pulte Homes who recruited specifically from different colleges. And so I said, hey, there's actually a recruiting event. You should just come. Like, you don't go here, but just, you know, come out, meet them, see how it goes, drop your resume, like, see what happens. Um, so I did that, and I got a call, and I ended up getting interviews and eventually job offers from four different Pulte Homes locations. And, like, think about 2004, the economy's great, real estate's on the rise. Like, this is a good time to get into um, real estate, whether you're on the sales side, marketing side, whatever you're going to do, like things are getting busters wherever you are, really, at this moment. Um, so I decided to go work at the North LA Ventura, which is the newest branch of Pulte at the time. And Pulte is a national home builder, publicly traded, you know, well-known producer of quality construction and single family homes. And so my my advice to you is, you know, in this first job that you decide to take after you leave here, pick a company that will invest in you and make good use of your time. Um, that's why I picked Pulte, not only because, you know, they're, they have a reputation as a great place to work, their comp is fantastic, but they have a great training program. And so the point of them recruiting all of these college grads was to bring you know, group cohorts of young people into the business and train them up and train them to be, you know, super agents. And so what they did was prepare a three-month training for all these cohorts of young graduates to come in, get your real estate license. You spend two weeks in finance. You spend two weeks in development. You spend two weeks out on the job site with the construction team. You'd spend um, two weeks, you know, with the escrow management people, um, learning how to get the deals closed. And so anyway, they moved you every two weeks. So you got a really well-rounded um, understanding of what business was and what was happening um, at the end of your training. At that point, you got a mentor assigned to you that would stick with you um, for the next, like, year and a half, practically. That was, like, your buddy to help you when you got in this sticky spot. Or anything like that. So um, I stayed at Pulte for two years. Um, and I uh, mentioned, you know, some of the best things about it were the training, the mentorship, and the compensation. But at that point, um, all of the selling agents at Pulte were getting 1.25% on every home sold. You were delivering and closing at least four homes per community per month. And you can work at multiple communities. Um, so all of that added up to like a really awesome comp for uh, you know, one year grad. So there's there's much um, wealth to be found selling real estate, um, developing real estate, financing real estate, all the way around. 
it's a great thing to be working. Um, what I didn't love about Pulte was not actually about Pulte, it was about uh, geography. Because when you look at you know this era in the 2000s, 2004, and all the home builders are you know buying vacant land, and it's in Lancaster, it's in Palmville, it's in Beaumont, um, it's not in you know, city center, it's not nobody's doing infill right now. What's a national home builder? They move on to do that later. So what this means is, you know, if you're 21 and you're living in a like bedroom community um, where everyone's, you know, kind of families and settled, and uh, you're like 65 miles away from uh, places that you might enjoy living more. So for me, that meant I'm like, I I want to get, I want to do this job, I want to do this downtown. So um, they send around secret shoppers. Um, to come see you, and they have pins with, you know, it's like incognito uh, video recording. And so they come to your office, you never know when they're coming, and they ask you questions, they interact with you as if they're a potential buyer, and um, it's it's like a secret interview. So I had one of those shoppers come through, and they liked what I was doing, they liked my style, and so they're like, all right, we're we're doing this adaptive reuse in downtown LA, where we're you know taking uh, toy factories, we're taking like the Nabisco the Kirby factory, and we're turning them into condos. So why don't you come work for us? So we did that. Um, still great compensation. Now better location. Um, however, now working for the smaller developers, things are. The way less structured than when you're working for like a national home builder that has you know major investors behind it and that sort of thing. So things are a little more volatile. And um, the thing about your career in real estate is like the markets come and go. And so you know, right now we're in a really interesting place because of inflation, climate crisis, geopolitical you know, struggles, a lot of things are in the balance and people are like, are we going into a recession? You know, what's gonna happen? And the truth is there are rapid cycles you know, every eight, 10 years. And so there's gonna be different things. In so um, you all know, like the great financial crisis hit, the bottom totally fell out of real estate last time I had two buildings that were across from the stable center. You may have been by them. Um, and uh, at the time, I think we had 1,100 escrows that were in process. And then, you know, as the market falls out, everybody's calling, everybody's coming in, they want their deposit back. And, and so things get, things get challenging. And it's just the reality. So uh, one thing that was really interesting about that particular um, period of time is that that is when developers got really interested in sustainability and the lead rating system really kind of like put its flag on the ground and people started noticing like, yeah, tenants and residents, they want sustainability because they know it is related to lower you know, utility costs. It's increasing health increasing productivity of workers. And so as this starts to build momentum, we start seeing like sustainable developments, sustainable materials in kind of the rise of green buildings at this time. So um, I was really lucky to work with a smaller developer but they were based out of Portland. And so they were interested in buying um, basically like run down blocks in downtown LA or other areas. Um, like the Pearl District, and like creating a location, creating a neighborhood where there was growth. So that's that's actually how I got interested in sustainability, needing to learn the lead rating system, what it means, what the value is, you know, why people want this, um, and you know how to deliver these green buildings because they're they're not the same 
as the buildings that we've been building the last 200 years. Construction hasn't changed a lot until really the last 20, where we have new technologies, proliferation of green building strategies, solar, battery storage, um, EV chargers, all these all these new and exciting things that help us live more sustainably. Um, so next job. Um, this is now 2008, markets bottomed out, we're about to. And so I go and begin volunteering with the US Green Building Council. Um, they are the creators of the lead rating system, and they have been slowly kind of um, purchasing every other green building rating system to bring them all under the same umbrella and harmonize them because there, there have been a major proliferation of different rating systems that use different metrics to determine green buildings. So, so um, I mentioned them because they have student groups. If you find yourself um, really interested in sustainability, they have a green building core in which you can you know, register your interest and then they'll put you on teams and you can go spend you know, five, 10 hours a week working on great building projects, interacting with you know, potential future clients um, and just like really upping your game and getting some uh, resume building skills um, through volunteerism. And it's also just a great network of professionals in this space. I think there are probably five or six thousand members across LA that are architects, engineers, developers, uh, lead consultants, you may, and so it's you know a pretty vibrant community and a good way to meet people and get your name out there and forge connections um, with future employers or partners or um, people that are like-minded about sustainability. So um, you know, now I told you about, you know, starting a career in the private sector for a natural home builder, then working for smaller developers, now going to a nonprofit focused on green building that's all about serving a mission. And so, you know, the nonprofits are great because they are advocates, they're passionate, and, uh, you know, they're about green buildings for everyone within this generation. So it's, um, it's very kind of liberating, but also a weird place to go into, like in a nonprofit environment when you've been working for profit um, in the private sector or something. So that you know, they they have their pros and cons in the um, So after USGBC, um, I got to do some really cool stuff. financial or technical in order to do a project. And so we launched that in 2016. And over the years, like we built a uh, environmental makerspace in Gardena. Um, we worked with a group in South LA and con converted a uh, school bus into a veggie bus that ran on vegetable oil and was a seed bank for the local community to, you know, alleviate some of the issues of food deserts. Um, so there's a certain like freedom and feel goodness about um, nonprofit work and sustainability in the built environment. Um, there's also workforce development that um, you know young people and people that are transitioning careers um, need access to programs that help them you know up their up their skills. And so we built a whole bunch of um, really neat workforce development programs. It was a great thing. Um, I'm going to get this is a really long story. I'm going to get to the end soon and then we'll, we'll talk amongst each other. Um, so uh, around uh, 2016, I found myself very uh, advocated for the state of things, um, you know, just due to the political climate. And you know, started getting really involved in advocacy for sustainability and for green buildings. 
and um, this led me to a lot of interaction with people at the city of color. And um, around 20, at the end of 2017, um, I was like, okay, I'm ready, I'm ready for my next thing. Like I put in almost 10 years here at the US Green Building Council. Like, what is my next thing? Where am I going now? I've done this for profit, I've done nonprofit. Um, and so um, a lot of interactions that I had with the city, um, they were like, wow, oh, you're competent and you have a huge network of green building advocates behind you and building owners and managers and um, tenants and like know people and you can get things done. Um, and so that helped me get a appointment position um, in the mayor's office. So I worked for Eric Garcetti for about three years. I worked there from 2018 to 2021, which was fascinating um, to really be like inside elected office and see how these policies get crafted, how do ordinances get passed, how you know the EJ movement has really like come to life. Um, you know, an entire movement around spending oil and gas drilling in Los Angeles. And so all of these things, you know, came to the forefront. So I served as the deputy chief sustainability officer for the city for that three year period, which is amazing. Um, the, you know, pros and cons, of course. Pros, you can enact some really progressive policy at the local level. Um, mayors actually have a lot of power to get things done. And so, you know, even when COVID hit, you know, there were a tremendous amount of like, transportation projects that got done when people were not driving around. Um, there was a progression on the clean grid for DWP. So they had, they made a pledge that they were going to be, you know, delivering 100% clean energy by 2045. We did a study and got them to move it up to 2030. And that changes things. Um, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and the power that gets delivered to all the residents, whether it's an uh, apartment building, manufacturing facility, or any any number of things. Um, so it was a really like fascinating time to be in local government um, and get things done. Uh, I got to work on uh, Biden campaigns and uh, administration work and a lot of policy papers. Um, the cons, as I as I end this and then we talk together, um, are that these positions have an end date, so it's unusual. Like if if you've taken an internship for the summer, you know you're starting this day, you're ending this day. But when you go out into your like true professional life, you don't often have jobs that have an end date. And when you work as an appointed official to an elected when they end, you then. And so, you know, you then launch off and do whatever your next thing is. So you all may have been attention, um, but Biden uh, uh, appointed Garcetti to be ambassador to India uh, around this time last year. And so it's like, okay, time to, <laughs> time to find my next thing as well. Um, and so again, through relationships, through network, um, found a position that I currently hold as the director of sustainability at American Realty Advisors. And um, we are one of the largest privately held um, investment managers. And um, what we do is we invest on behalf of about 550 investors, most of whom are institutional investors, um, they're municipal pension funds, labor um, management pension funds, sovereign wealth funds uh, to the tune of uh, $11.5 billion. So they invest with us. We in turn buy and sell properties through 11 different funds that we manage. And I manage the sustainability of all of these properties. And ARA as a whole, um, I also manage our responsible investment policy, which um, today we'll talk about climate risk and how um, the rise of climate modeling and frequent 
the extreme weather events is causing some shifts in where geographically uh, we want to invest or not invest. Because at the end of the day, we need to secure returns. And so um, I will stop there and um, we'll, we'll talk amongst ourselves. Let me switch this slide really fast. And what I'd like to do is hear from you guys a little bit about um, you know, if your interest in real estate, anything that you're really interested in talking about today, we can make sure we cover what's important to you. Um, and then if you want to share um, anything that you're bringing to the class in terms of uh, knowledge that you have to share or experiences that you've had so far, so I'm going to put up that slide and we'll be able to talk. Sure. Um, yeah, my name's Chris. Um, I'm all from actually from Irvine, so I kind of, <clears throat> I've watched like the development of the Orange County area kind of happen over the past year. I guess the reason I'm interested in real estate in general is because I'm not willing to live my life until I'm 60 years old working for another company making something else rich. So I'd rather, you know, use, use real estate as a vehicle to First of all, grow my own network so that I can use those assets to start my own company to help people get home, get homes that might not traditionally be able to, like foreigners, lots of people that have you know bad credit for some reason or another. Um, that's kind of my short to medium term goal. Um, as for what I bring to the table, um, I'm just a guy that's trying to learn as much as I can. Recently, I actually did a, I did a project on the 2008 recession, mm -hmm. and I summed it up in like a 10 minute video. Um, if you guys want to watch that, I can give you a link. But um, that's all I really have right now. Um, I actually would like the opportunity to ask a question in relation to the 2008 recession and what might be happening today. I don't know if everybody knows at the time, but maybe it's a presentation. Actually, yeah. Yeah. Um, go ahead and repeat your question. I think so. Everybody can hear it, and I'll do my best yeah. to field it. Sorry, I didn't actually ask the question yet. I was asking that. But um, okay. Essentially, um, after the, following the 2008 recession, as part of the government's actions to uh, help relieve the banks and investment banks, they purchased a large amount of mortgages um, from them. And so since 2008, the government has actually been purchasing more mortgages. So the, the, the value, I think, is somewhere in the trillions right now of the mortgages they own. Um, and recently, this kind of flew under the radar, but I, I, and I was trying to find where I found this at, where I was reading this at, but I couldn't find it at the moment because I didn't want to take too much time away from listening to me. But essentially, the government released a statement that was implying that they're planning on selling um, the majority of the mortgages that they currently hold. Now, my question is, what implications do you think that would have on the market of real estate in general? And then, play that, that's the question. Yeah. That's a great question. I'm trying to think through like everything that's happening right now. The first thing that's happening in my mind, just because it's been on my mind for so long is um, the rise of investment into single family rental. So this is not going to answer your question, but I think it's important to bring it up as a market dynamic. And because we're talking about home builders and sales, um, I believe the stat is institutional investors purchase, I'm going to say either 35 or 40 percent of single family homes that were built in the last year. Um, we do it pretty much, you know, most institutional investors are moving into this space and it, it brings up um, a lot of feelings on both sides of the issue because, you know, the developers that have in the past, Bernard, Fulton, um, TriPoint, you name them, um, their products would be built for sale um, to individuals. And now a lot of their product is being sold to institutional investors and then rented. So there's one side of the argument, um, particularly from like community groups and local government that's saying, wait a second, even though you are building, you're, you're adding stock to you know, the amount of housing that's available, but you're taking away from, you know, family-owned homes and adding to investor-owned investor rentals. And this has to do with 
cost of living. Um, this also has to do with demographic shifts because um, you, you may relate to this. I, I relate to this. The majority of people on the planet right now are actually single. They don't have kids. They don't own a home. They actually are really interested in sustainability. They want to be mobile. And, um, you know, some, some are financially secure, the majority are not. And so this is leading to, you know, high rental values, um, high returns for investors, and a lot of single family rental communities that are not necessarily in um, cities either. These are like, you know, 40 minutes outside of Atlanta, um, 30 minutes outside of Chattanooga. And so these are, again, areas that have land to develop. Um, so there's, you know, everybody wants to alleviate the housing shortage issue, but, you know, this, this can be a very long and deep debate about like, how do you do it? And it is single family rental. You know, morally, morally good. Um, so that did not answer your question, but it was definitely a, because I think it's fascinating and you can read a lot about it on both sides of the issue. Um, the government selling mortgages, and what will that do? It's like who's who's selling, who buy, who is buying, and who. And so, uh, if anyone um, online has any ideas, feel free to add into the chat, but I'll write that down. Well, well Cameron, uh, I don't really have necessarily any knowledge or skills to offer the class. I was, I wasn't even considering for the Santa until a couple of months ago, um, when I started preparing these seminars, but, um, I'm really interested in like art and design, so I think like going into real estate development is something I'm interested in. Um, and yeah, I'm just excited to learn about the sustainability. Thank you. In my curiosity is really more school specific, but it's also relevant to California. So I'm from Hawaii, and one of the first things we did was like tourism and real estate are just like and uh, I guess what my concern is is that you know, all these rise in sea levels, um, all these beachfront properties, like, are they going to last? What does this mean for investors? Are we going to choose to put them anywhere? Um, do we really continue like building these properties, or do they have, or like at least still be seen? Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that also can apply. That is a lifestyle that people are going to continue and like how proud is that going to be going into the future? I guess I also don't really have anything to offer. I'm like also learning I'm like really early in my
All right, I'm not sure if we have any questions. I don't think we have time to go for everybody next that's on Zoom. But yeah, if there are any questions or if anyone on Zoom had a question, feel free. Otherwise, we'll end of the slide. All right, so a couple learning objectives um, for today. We definitely want to talk about uh, building energy teams and energy efficiency. This is really, you know, the backbone of the sustainability puzzle that you're trying to solve with each building, buildings on a campus, transportation moving through um, your projects, and um, you know how to really optimize them for <clears throat> human health and productivity. Um, we'll talk about some basics of design for green buildings. Um, if we have time, we'll talk about the role of trades. Um, so these were our plumbers, electricians, framers, um, and others that take a job site from uh, you know undeveloped land into an actual built structure. And um, we'll talk about as well the intersection between buildings and climate. So we're not going to get through all 14 <laughs> items today, of course, but we'll do our best to go through um, on the left the connection between buildings and climate change, um, kind of ABCs of high performance buildings, causes and effects, solutions, and then value of high So I mentioned ESG. Is anyone familiar with uh, what ESG stands for? Almost. Um, environmental, social, and governance. Is that what you said? Okay. Kind of. Okay. <laughs> Good enough. Good job. Um, so this is this is somewhat different from the traditional view of sustainability, and there are so many jobs in ESG. Um, throughout not just real estate companies, but really every company. And this is happening because um, I think companies have woken up to the call um, of young people and scientists and others about the state of the climate. And so you all probably remember in 2015, the signing of the Paris Climate Agreement, which was really notable because that was the first time that um, you know, all the different countries in the world came together and signed a pact to say we're going to limit global emissions to 1.5 degrees C. And so, um, as a result, there were a number of different climate pledges that were signed onto from corporates, from governments, etc. And so, have you guys heard the term net zero? Maybe. So net zero, I feel like is thrown around so much in sustainability and ESG because it's really talking about um, global emissions and bringing them down to zero. So I should actually show you a different slide deck and I'll do that right after this. Um, but figuring out how to do this was actually one of my first charges when I worked at the city because the city of LA had pledged to be net zero by 2050, meaning that it will drive down emissions from all sectors of the economy, transportation, energy, uh, buildings, waste, food systems, um, uh, and oil and gas even too. And so we were charged to figure out like, how do you actually do that? It's all well and good to say like, yeah, we're gonna be net zero by 2050, but 
like how how do you actually take you know 32 trillion um, in, in emissions down to zero? And um, I'll show you some graphs on like actually how you do that. But um, a lot of this has to do with electrification and providing clean energy, 100% uh, clean energy to all the cars, all the buildings, et cetera, which um, is complicated because right now our grid is only about 30% clean. The rest of it is coal, natural gas, um, and other fossil fuels that are being burnt to deliver power to every outlet um, and every gas station. So um, back to ESG, this is, this is what I do pretty much every day at ARA. And it looks like a hodgepodge of things because it is. Um, and we're at that moment where ESG, environment, social, and governance principles are integrating into every facet of the business, whether we're talking about real estate or we're talking about fashion or really any business. So we're trying to figure out how do we use less energy? How do we use less waste? How do we have healthier materials that we can keep out of the landfill and get a second life through circular economy? Um, how do we talk about what we're doing in a way that you know makes people care and makes them want to use our product or use our service? And so, you know, all of these different things come into play um, as responsible investment and sustainability, you know, really pervade and start to rule uh, the markets as a key value. And so um, some of the things that I'm not sure if you can read it <laughs> with, with all of this, um, but you can see in the top left corner, um, we're really talking about investor relations and all businesses, particularly, you know, uh, investor driven real estate businesses, we really care what the investors have to say. And this is that this is actually the reason that you're seeing the rise of sustainability programs and ESG professionals, because the investors are thinking about their duty to their investees. So I mentioned our, our investors, our pension funds. So is anyone familiar with kind of the pension fund system? Not so much. Um, so let's just say, for example, I'll use the city of LA because when you work at the city of LA, um, once you work there for five years, you have become vested and it means that you receive a pension. And so this is, this is very common for people that work at the city. Um, for teachers, people that work in um, government, people that are parts of unions um, often receive a pension. So you work there every month, you're contributing a bit of your salary into the pension. The pensions grow exponentially. And when you hit the retirement age, you receive a certain amount from the pension every month until you die. And so it's a great reason to work in jobs that you know offer that as a benefit so you can imagine the pension funds have to as a fiduciary manage all of these monies that are coming in because they have to have enough to pay the people that have paid into the pension when they retire so does that make sense yeah pretty much okay so what the people at the pensions have to do is figure out, okay, what is my investment scenario? You know, they're going to want to have equities. They're going to want to have stocks and bonds, and they definitely want to have real estate. Um, and one of the reasons they want to have real estate in their portfolio is that it is a great hedge against inflation. So pretty much any pension fund that you can find will be investing between eight and 10% of their portfolio into real estate. And so now these investors, of course, uh, want to make sure that the funds that are being invested um, are going to create the returns that they need. And sometimes the returns need to be greater because one of their other um, strategic investments in the portfolio doesn't pan out. And so there's, a, there's an interesting give and take. 
between um, the investors, the returns, and what they need. So our job is to make sure we give them the returns so that they can fulfill their duty to everyone that's drawing from the pension. So um, investor relations has to do with talking to the investors about their concerns, their concerns about climate, about climate risk, about where their funds are being invested, if the buildings that they're investing in are being well managed, if the buildings that they're investing in have green building certifications like LEED, Bitwell, Energy Star, um, because investors do not want to invest in you know, non-institutional quality properties. Um, they want, you know, I'm gonna say class A um, properties that are gonna perform well, that tenants want to be a part of and be, be leasing with them. So um, a lot of questionnaires come in from the investors and they wanna know everything about the portfolio. So, um, we have a lot of investors in our core fund. Um, are you guys familiar with a core fund versus like a value fund? Okay. So core fund for us is about 80% of our portfolio. And core funds are properties that we plan to keep for eight to 10 to 12 years. And these are apartment buildings. These are industrial buildings, they are retail, and office. Those are really the four categories um, of, of a typical core fund. Um, the core fund is open-ended, which means investors can invest in the core fund at any time, and the core fund doesn't end. So um, a closed fund is, one that has an end date. And so it, it has monies come in, um, you also cannot draw back. So once you're invested in a closed end fund, your money is staying put until the fund closes and those properties um, are exited. So there, it's a different investment thinking. So the investors, particularly in the core fund where, um, you know, we're going to be holding these properties for a long period of time um, are really, really interested in sustainability. They want to know exactly how many kilowatt hours of energy we used throughout the year, how many gallons of water, how many GHG emissions happened um, throughout the year. Um, then they want to know the attributes of the property, how many EV chargers, how much solar, um, how much uh, LEDs are in the property versus you know, fluorescent lights. Um, they're even now interested in DEI, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is a really interesting um, crossover when you work in sustainability because uh, I know when I got started, I thought everything was about the environment. Um, and now, you know, really the, the S in ESG is getting into social conditions, um, pay equity, um, making sure you know there's diversity in um, hiring and diversity of thought in these boardrooms, and so um, the investors want to know all of that. So we get a lot of questionnaires um, constantly that want to know the ins and outs of the program. Um, there's program management, marketing, um, data collection is incredibly important because you know we've all. I think read about greenwashing and um, how many claims are made by different companies that maybe cannot be um, stood up or proved at the end of the day, which is like death, you know, the death nail for <laughs> um, people that are claiming green practices. And um, so data collection is really important for our program. Um, we can literally sign into a dashboard and I can show you every property, exactly how it's performed um, in terms of energy, water, waste, and GHGs. Um, I, can, I can run these stats for you. I can compare our properties to 
you know, all of the other funds that are like ours throughout the United States. And so we have um, a whole variety of kind of like uh, fintech services that are pulling, um, you know, data out of all of our meters every 15 seconds. Um, so we can keep our, our finger on the pulse of how the buildings were pulled because it's important to us, it's important to the investors. You know, we want to know if there's a major leak um, and we don't want to wait until, you know, the next building cycle to find out that uh, we had a major problem that we didn't know about. So data collection resources, it's terrible. Um, there's project management, which is always interesting. So I'll, I'll just talk about the green building certifications for the moment. So we have about half of our portfolio that has a green building certification. Uh, such as LEED, GitLo, um, there's IRIM, Institute for Real Estate Management, is another one that's very popular in the market, um, and Energy Star. And the thing is, all of these need to be renewed every three years or every one year in the case of Energy Star. So there's a whole uh, there's a whole market out there, a whole industry that's just doing green building certifications. That's all they do, day in and day out. Uh, processing the credits, you know, uploading the credits and the drawings, um, and earning earning the scores. And this is really important um, for data management as well to be able to back up. Like, yeah, we have we have green buildings in our portfolio, and they're verified by a third party, such as you know, CBC, such as Center for Active Design, um, and EPA and DOE, which run um, the Energy Star. There's research, which is happening um, constantly, especially on the value of green buildings. Um, a lot has been done recently on COVID and how you can um, kind of ensure a feeling of safety for tenants that are coming back to the building because everyone's everyone's still concerned about this. We know COVID isn't going away, but like, what can you enact in terms of a policy or a process to give people some peace of mind that everything that you can do to mitigate the spread of contagious diseases is um, in place or ready to be rolled out at your project. There's been a ton of research done um, by the CDC um, and a lot of um, uh, recommended policies that are out there and frameworks that you can use to um, mitigate future Variants in circulation through society. So there's also public disclosure. So we'll talk about regulations for a second. Um, many cities are enacting building performance standards. The um, city of LA is working on one, but the most well known of the building performance standards is called Local Law 97, which was enacted um, in New York City. And so there are certain laws that say, you know, you um, need to disclose how much energy and water you are using on an annual basis. And, you know, over time, you need to reduce that use by 20%. These new building performance standards are saying, not only do you need to do the benchmarking, so the annual disclosure, but by 2024, you cannot um, you know, use or produce uh, more than X amount of greenhouse gas emissions. You have to stay under the cap. If you're over the cap, you're going to pay a fine. And the fine, you know, per unit um, that, that the building has gone over. And so this is going to change the market. Um, and I think, you know, the major cities are where it starts and then um, it may proliferate from there. But um, this is probably the best way to drive down emissions is to set the cap, have everyone understand, you know, what their usage is um, in, in relation to that cap, and then figure out how to be under the cap by the regulation dates. So they get more stringent. So the cap goes down usually at like a certain amount every five years. And what they're trying to do is um, basically legislate net zero. 
So I was saying like net zero is like getting to zero by 2050 or sooner. So these building performance standards are, um, you know, taking a step change down about every five years leading to zero. So that that is one way that cities are um, trying to make the building stocks within them um, lower their emissions. And, you know, the fees, the fines are pretty substantial. Um, it, it also can put a building owner or developer on like a bad list with the city, um, which is not good because if you want a full permit, you want to do a renovation, you want to do any number of things, um, you need to have a license to operate um, within the city. So this regulation is really kind of at the top of um, people's minds when it comes to like, how are we going to operate these buildings? How are we going to make sure we're under the cap so we don't get fined? Um, and so, you know, buildings operating sustainably and not polluting. Um, when we get into, you know, some sticky points, is like, what, what do we do? How do we budget this? Because what if, what if you just replaced a boiler? A natural gas boiler that you use, you know, for heating for the building. Um, what if you just did that, and now you know you're not able to stay under the cap? That's two. That's just two years away. So you have to you have to think about budgeting and long term capital improvements so that you can stay compliant with your local city. Um, also, tenant relations um, and community relations are up here because they are also paramount. You know, we 100% care about our investors and we 100% care about our tenants because as you are doing asset management, development, et cetera, you want your tenants to um, stay in place and you want to have 100% leased building to optimize your value. And so um, we do all kinds of things for tenants. Um, maybe in the buildings that you live in, we've had uh, interesting like tenant engagement events, ice cream socials, any number of things. Um, one of the things that we do that I think is fun to promote biodiversity is we have beehives, honey producing beehives on our roofs. And our tenants love it. Um, they have events where they get to meet the beekeeper, um, they can get a jar of honey that was produced from uh, the bees that, that are on their site. And it's just a really nice um, tie-in with sustainability. We also uh, do a lot of uh, tenant awareness. So one of the things that I found really interesting during COVID, um, I'll put this poll out to you is, in the office properties that were completely vacant, for over a year, um, do you think the energy use in those buildings reduced by over 50% or under? So you have your usual, like 100%, you know, leased building operating, you know, 18 hours a day. And then it goes from that to Nobody, no tenants, no tenants. But there's still some lighting, HVAC, that sort of thing. Um, so how many people think energy dropped by over 50%? And then how many people think under? Okay, the under 50s have it. So this is an interesting thing because you would think on the surface, you know, there's no tenants. Tenants are using, they're plugging everything in, you know, they're in there, they're adjusting temperature set points, they're, you know, using a ton of energy, et cetera. But it was very interesting to find that the um, energy use only dropped by about 30%, uh, even though the buildings were vacant. Go ahead. Yeah, it, 
it can be um, when you have to like ramp up from like a off state to an on state. Um, no one ever knew because no one ever wanted to do the experiment to find out like how much do these base building systems energy use really use compared to the tenant flow. Um, so there was not a way to know that without having totally empty buildings, which is not an experiment anyone ever wanted to run, but happened unfortunately. Um, but it was a good eye opener for building owners to be able to say, okay, this these base building systems are really important to optimize the temperature set points, um, et cetera, because that's actually where the majority of the energy is for each building is. Um, okay, how about another poll just to shake things up for a little bit? Um, which sectors do you think have done the best coming out of COVID? So I mentioned office, industrial, retail, and multifamily. If you were an investor, which few of those would you be interested? Where would you want to put them in right now? There's not an, exactly a right answer. This is, this is your investment theory. I was going to respond to that. Yeah. But I actually kind of misinterpreted what you asked that question. Oh, sorry. So, no, no, my fault. <laughs> but um, I will say that uh, when the percent, when COVID mm -hmm. actually happened, um, retail stores and specifically like the movement, like when people were most, they got a lot of benefit off of it. They got super, like super heavy increased customer traffic, higher revenues, and a lot more investments. I believe their stock prices went way up as a result of that. Yeah, it's a good point. And not all retail is the same, obviously. Like those particular like home improvement shops did great. Um, anything with like a grocery anchor retail did well. Um, so did all drive through. So, um, so, you know, it's, it's not exactly fair to say, like, is retail a good investment? Um, but how about industrial? Who would put their money in industrial? Like, and by industrial, I mean like warehouses, logistics. Got some takers, okay, okay. Um, and how about office? So what about office sector? <laughs> and uh, yeah, for medical offices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to do this to like uh, Zoom, but like for a lot of them, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great point. So I'll tell you our investment philosophy right now is called sheds and beds. So um, we are very interested in industrial. It's had incredible returns because of the rise of e-commerce. And so as people were, you know, mostly at home, only really going out for the essentials to these grocery and retail stores. For the most part, they ordered things on Amazon, and things had to be shipped from UPS, from FedEx, from Amazon, um, etc. And so, the rise of rents for um, industrial properties is through the roof. Um, there's so little um, on the market right now that you know, companies like ours are getting into development. We don't do a ton of development, but we're finding opportunities where it makes sense to do conversion from office to industrial, office to life science, et cetera. And so the rise of um, industrial is big customers right now. Um, also multifamily, multifamily um, and single family residential quite well. As an asset class, and then for um, office, you know, we're planning to, um, you know, either redevelop. We're going to hold some office, but we're trying to kind of exit, just um, given the dynamic of the market and where we think the values are headed. Um, it's interesting because each 
each firm, um, each investment company has different investment pieces. So I'm telling you ours, it's just, it, it's, it's what our research um, leads us to believe. In. And so the markets are always changing, the dynamics are different. Um, and that's true in the different geographies uh, across the US. And of course, um, you know, when you look into the European markets or um, Asia Pacific, it's a different kind of market. So do you guys want to take a break or do you want to keep going? I'm going to do a time, time check here. How are we feeling? What's that? Let's keep going till noon. So let's go like 20 more minutes and we'll take a break. Alright, so this this busy slide is just to say that the ESG and sustainability professionals in the world um, have very multi-dimensional and kind of long-reaching influence in all different parts of the company, whether it's marketing, communications, asset management, investor relations, investment group, um, there's there's a voice that's needed from the sustainability professional in every single firm. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, buildings and climate. So it's really amazing to me to think the stat is I think we're going to build the equivalent of a new New York City. Um, I think it's like every every two weeks for the next like 30 years. I mean, it just blows your mind. It blows your mind how much construction will happen. And so it's really important that we not only you know optimize the buildings we already have, but of course ensure that the new construction that we bring to light is as sustainable as it can be because it will exist for at least 50 years. That's kind of the typical life cycle of building. And so we have to think about for new construction, how can we ensure we're delivering you know, extreme energy efficiency? Maybe it's net zero. You know, is it powered by renewables? Can it recycle water? Um, do we have native plants on site? Um, and, and how do we actually design for you know the future circularity? So it's important to understand the materials you're selecting and all of the different systems and how they will come together for each and every building. So we mentioned fossil fuels, um, and right now we know our statistic in LA is. The grid is 30% clean, 70% dirty. And um, so, you know, a lot of the energy mix coming from the grid being delivered to your building um, is, is directly influencing how much greenhouse gas is produced. And so, if you imagine like all the different energy uses in this building, um, you can plug your phone in or your laptop in your wall, that's using energy. The lights use energy. The HVAC is using energy. The conductor is using energy. Um, the heating and cooling system is probably powered by natural gas. I'm not sure about that, but you know, the majority of buildings are. And so all of these uses are creating greenhouse gas emissions because energy has to be produced to deliver to the building for the energy. Or for the so, you know, the eventual goal to deliver 100% clean energy to every customer um, is how we actually deliver on that net zero promise, um, how we produce zero carbon buildings um, is by producing energy on site from renewables and purchasing energy that is on site. So it's kind of the it's an elusive goal, but one that I think can be really sustainable. So the industry is definitely shifting, and um, here's something you might want to write down. I heard um, you guys are asked some questions at the end of the seminar. 
And um, so we want to make sure, you know, just a quick definition on high performance buildings. Um, they use less energy and emit less carbon, and they in turn reduce the effects of climate change. Okay, here's our next poll, and people online can use the chat if you'd like. Um, so we know buildings are a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so the poll question is, what percentage of carbon emissions are caused by buildings in the US? So thinking about transportation, mobility, airplanes, ships, heavy industry, and then just our everyday commercial buildings, which are um, which are the highest emitters. So these are these are the stats, and this is actually um, exactly true for the city of LA that um, buildings are the cause of 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I think people are surprised by this stat because people think like LA, cars, LAX, like it must be the cars, or maybe it's the trucks that are going from like the port to all of these logistics warehouses, like it must be transportation. Um, but it is actually our built environment, all the buildings that we live, work, play, study in um, that contribute the most to emissions. So this is why it's important um, to do sustainable development and to optimize all of our buildings, both existing and new for the future. Um, now this, this is a New York City stat. Um, in New York City, actually 70% of their emissions are from buildings, which is why perhaps we see some of those stringent regulations, um, like the building performance standard, the local law 97 that we talked about, um, coming first from New York. Okay, and where does energy come from? So there's site energy and there's source energy. And so the site energy is the amount of fuel and electricity the building consumes at, at the site. So this is natural gas. We don't use oil as much um, for heating and cooling as East Coast. That's more of a like New York, Boston, uh, Northeast uh, type of heating fuel. Um, here it's mostly, mostly natural gas. So we have all of these fuels coming to the building and being used in different ways, producing um, CO2 that enters the atmosphere. And we've already talked a lot about electricity and its hidden carbon footprint because the grid is 30% clean and 70% burning ethane, which you need. All right, so aside from the site energy that you use you know, here in this building on site, there's source energy, and source energy is the amount of raw fuel required, um, including the losses that happen along the grid. So if you have heard of um, maybe a methane leak, um, that is a very common occurrence across a natural gas pipeline. So you have, you have a natural gas plant where fuel is, it is moving through underground pipes to get to uh, locations that it needs to get to, to get to LMU, to get to the airport, to get to you know, different hubs from which it then goes to buildings. It, unfortunately, a lot of that natural gas is lost in the pipeline as it moves through, through loops. And so that can be detected. It releases methane that's even actually more potent than carbon dioxide. And can have you know, massive health effects for communities um, as it moves along and unfortunately uh, has to use. Um, same goes for electricity. So you've all seen like the power lines, overhead power lines that you know run from where the electricity is generated to the end users. And there are also leaks, it can be up to 30% is lost um, during transition. So um, the source energy number is often quite a lot higher than the site energy number. 
there's that. So this is just to say at our end use site, at our building that we are in, um, if we can save energy here, um, it, it reduces the amount of energy that needs to be produced elsewhere to bring to our site. Alright, so sustainability is more than just energy and carbon. Um, Let's hear, let's hear from, yeah, let's go for three people just to say what, what does sustainable mean? What's that bring to your mind when you hear the word sustainable? What's it like for people without like negative repercussions? Right. Two more. <laughs> go for it. I think the word also is like consistent and constant over a period. Mm -hmm. Great. One more, one more speaker. So we have a couple of definitions. Um, I like I like the United Nations definition. This is the one that's like the world has kind of gotten behind. Um, so a way of living and working that meets meets the needs of the present without compromising. The ability of future generations to return. I think that makes a lot of sense. Does that resonate? Yes. All right. So um, we just talked about high performance buildings and how they're different from regular buildings before we take our break. Let me see. Um, so this is an example um, from NYC. And um, has anyone heard of Passive House? This is like another certification that's growing in awareness of building owners and designers. Um, it has to do with optimizing the um, building envelope so that you're basically able to like passively heat and cool the structure um, with much less. Um, energy infrastructure needed, which is a HVC itself. Okay, so here, here are three qualities that high performance buildings have in common. So they're they're efficient. They use less energy and water compared to you know the same the exact same building across the street because they're designed and operated um, to be efficient in the first place. They are healthy. So they improve health and productivity of workers and occupants. Um, one study that I came across recently that I thought was fascinating is out of Harvard, and it's called the Cognitive Effects Study. Um, what they did was they had like two identical rooms, if you imagine like this. One room um, had the control group, which would be us, and we're here, and we're Experiences experiencing this, uh, you know, amount of air changes per hour, this temperature setting, uh, we feel comfortable. I think. Um, in, and then let's say in the room, exact same room next door, they increase the air changes per hour to three times what we experience here. And now they give um, online tests, almost like um, SimCity simulations to people in both rooms. And they found that the people that have the increased air changes per hour um, are doing like significantly better on this uh, online city city um, kind of building simulations. And so it's interesting to just think about the effect on productivity, the effects on health, and maybe you felt it, like when you walked into a lead building, as opposed to, you know, a building that was built, you know, 50 years ago. Um, maybe it's a combination of like the daylighting, um, the materials, and you know, the way you experience the building. Um, not only is it efficient, but it's also making you um, more productive and more healthy because of your experience. Um, within 
those environments. Um, so lastly, um, these high performance buildings are environmentally responsible. So they use less materials, they use environmentally friendly or renewable resources. Um, they're not off gassing, they don't have that new car smell, hopefully, when you enter them. Um, so the products are known and tested and verified to be contributing to efficiency and not refracting the heat. And they require systems thinking, which is a great term. So this, I like this um, analogy to the human body because I think it, it translates very well. Um, when you're feeling healthy, your systems are working together. Respiration, heartbeat, digestion, um, all, the, all the different body systems connecting your brain, your heart, and your lungs. And um, when one system works against the others, it, you know right away. Um, your body tells you. And so this is how we can think of the building side is in all the systems working together in harmony, not detracting from one another. When our end goals are efficiency, healthy um, productivity, and environmental outcomes. So um, another another way to say it, um, besides the term systems thinking, is it's a whole building approach. So not thinking um, in uh, a system in isolation. But thinking of it in terms of how the entire building will function. So here's a nice diagram that's showing the water systems, uh, heating and cooling, uh, renewable energy on the roof, light shelves to keep um, the thermal impact down, uh, vegetated roof to ensure that. Um, is protected from unneeded thermal load. Um, in the basement, it might be providing a water treatment plant. So this is, uh, I like this one, that showing different systems. Okay, so we'll just talk really quickly about systems working well together and not working well together. And um, then I think we'll be taking our, taking our break. Um, so let's think of a system that doesn't work well. Um, I'll just give an example of pipes without insulation. So let's say you're moving water throughout the building because you want to heat it or cool it, or you want to use it in a sink, um, or toilet, or shower. Um, when you insulate a pipe, um, it helps to keep the coolness or keep the heat of whatever water is flowing through that system. Um, no insulation, and you have heat loss, heat gain um, happening. And so that's just one example of this. And here's a good term to think about, integrated project delivery, because if I'll, I'll just say the opposite of integrated project delivery is, you know, an architect that is working on their own, delivers plans to a contractor, the contractor takes the plans, tries to interpret them, uh, build the systems, but they find that the systems that the architect, you know, worked on and delivered to them don't actually work in practice. However, um, the other scenario would be an integrated project delivery where all the parties, the architect, the construction manager, the engineer, the contractor, are actually working together as a group, not siloed, working on individual pieces so that they actually, you know, design, build, and deliver the building that was intended from the beginning because they have worked together to solve any inconsistencies in the, in the project. All right. Do five minute break is all right, and then we'll go. We'll go probably like one more hour. All right, so I'll see you guys at twelve o two or so.
guess we should jump in. Okay, so let's talk about climate and weather and all these crazy climate risk scenarios and climate modeling. Um, so I'm sure you all know this. There's been a huge uptick. I feel like the headlines are like worse and worse. It's like, you know, this is the seventh year in a row that we've had the highest temperatures or the worst wildfires or severe drought or extreme storms on the East Coast or you know, flooding in Germany. It's just like, you can't, you can't not uh, face that almost every day there's some extreme weather event um, that's caused by climate change and, and shifts that are happening. So there is a difference between weather and climate. I won't make you guys talk about the difference here, but why don't we go ahead and just define the two terms. So weather is every day. Weather is now able to be predicted fairly well about three and four days. And it's, it'll rain, it'll snow, there's a front coming through, whether a cold front or uh, standing on winds. And so, you know, this is how we experience um, our day-to-day -day temperatures, uh, wind, and, and other you know natural natural occurrences. So climate is the pattern that we experience over time. So weather is like a one-day data point, whereas climate is is a trend line. Um, you know what's happening in California in terms of high heat days over four years. Um, that's more of climate as opposed to today is 68 degrees sunny and white. So we want to think about the normal temperature of the earth and we can we can devise this information although we didn't always have thermometers or record keeping. Um, however we can actually um, take ice samples. This is how Scientists are able to say, like, what well, was the Earth's temperature 400,000 years ago? I would say it with certainty. So, in the ice core lab, they literally pour um, these cylinders, and this way you can determine from the samples and what's frozen inside um, what was temperature, what was what was the climate. So you can see um, temperature and climate does appear to be cyclical. Um, there are natural cycles, periods of the year that are warmer and colder, just how we experience seasons, more so than um, maybe other parts of the US, but still there's seasonality that repeats the sun. Um, it's also directly related to how much um, carbon dioxide is in the air. So you can see they they follow each other. And this rise in carbon that you see on the right hand of the screen is why people, uh, scientists, climate scientists, etc., are really concerned because for the first time um, in August of 19, we hit um, above 350 parts per million of CO2, and that is considered uh, a catastrophic number, a number beyond which um, you know, human life will be able to sustain as we go. So this has led to the rise of um, climate emergency falling, but as I mentioned previously in the class, because um, this is something that we never experienced as humanity, um, this frequent like, weather events and this type of concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it's no surprise that temperatures have been rising, um, not just here, but all over the earth. And um, these rising temperatures are you know, causing ice sheets to melt, sea levels to rise, the temperature of our oceans to also climb to unsustainable levels 
to support the life that we have on them. And so um, this is why people are concerned and getting involved in climate action. And so they are showing us on this chart, you know, when the industrial revolution starts, just to draw our attention to the fact that um, pre-industrialization um, things were more simple. We were not using fossil fuels to the extent that we are now. So the rise of industrialization uh, and an increase in population that is is something to um, the greenhouse effects, which are effects we don't necessarily have. This is the trend. Why are fossil fuels called fossil fuels? It's because uh, the carbon from coal and oil that was buried underground um, was dug up, burned um, in order to power our buildings, power our cars, et cetera. So um, they are literally fossil. They come from the fuel comes from the fossil. And so we can think of um, greenhouse gases being trapped in the atmosphere um, in terms of this greenhouse. So if you've been in a greenhouse, um, you probably notice the difference in temperature as you walk in, you know, this light is entering the greenhouse, this sum of that light converts to heat um, for the plants that is in, uh, enveloped by those glass walls. So you could think of the planet uh, in a similar fashion. And so the Earth's average temperature is 56 degrees, the moon is minus nine, and um, without, the, without the greenhouse effect, it's not entirely bad. Uh, it keeps the balance of our, our biome together to support our life on Earth, but when things become too hot, uh, it, changes, it changes the math on what, what can go in. So we, we talked just for a minute about all of these different kind of bad news, climate weather headlines that have been bombarding us now for three years that are hard to take your eyes off of, but um, it's true. And, and they haven't, <laughs> they have not gotten, they have not gotten better. They probably will not for some time without major changes like we're talking about in how our built environment. All right, we're gonna skip this question. <laughs> I think I know the answer. Not, not to everybody online, but um, everybody in this room. So this is showing us um, a major shift, um, a change that took place after 1985, where you can see uh, temperatures beginning to rise significantly um, from previous annual, annual temperature records. So we know climate is warming. This is not new news. People are feeling the effects and impacts of climate change. Um, won't take too much time on this because I think everybody realizes dry places are getting drier, hot places are getting hotter, wildfires are bigger, hotter, and more frequent. And we're seeing big shifts in food and wildlife cycles because of all of these factors: heat, drought. Storms are bigger and cause more damage. Let's let's take the chance to talk about climate risk. Um, so, quick poll: Would you, if you're an investor right now, how confident would you feel in investing in the Miami? Okay, we've got some head shaking. And what? What does it make you think of when you think of Miami? What, what, what risk is there that you might not want to take? And this is a major conundrum right now for investors and for um, investment managers like us because we talked about the investor's aim is to be able to fulfill their fiduciary duty for their pensioners or 
whoever their um, constituents are. They do that by investing with investment managers like us. So they trust us with, with that duty to invest in properties that are going to generate a return to keep the whole cycle moving forward positively. And so, you know, there are major questions in acquisition and due diligence right now. Um, we're in a major investment cycle because there's a lot of capital looking to be deployed right now into real estate because of the state of inflation um, and the returns that, that can be achieved in real estate investment. And so where, where do we deploy this capital? So we talked about some good asset types. ARA feels strongly about industrial, feels strongly about multifamily. And so we're looking for deals. We're looking for development deals and looking for acquisitions. Um, we are looking strictly in the United States and we're looking at certain markets. Um, certain hot markets are not necessarily climate friendly markets. So if we think about great investable markets right now, Florida is one, Arizona, is another. Um, and we know those two states to be facing very different climate risks. So Florida, we've got um, pretty consistent hurricane damage, we've got flooding, sunny day flooding and rainy day flooding, we've got sea level rise. Those are really the main three, I would say, for, for Florida consistently. Um, but then we've got Arizona with high heat days, uh, wildfires, and uh, you know, with the consistent state of drought, um, we have to ask ourselves these questions of like, how do we choose um, assets in markets that we believe will generate returns? We don't want to invest in a property that's going to see major flooding because we're going to lose tenant revenue, we're going to, we're going to you know, incur uh, repair costs, deal with insurance, you know, a whole number of issues. We just want, we want a great building that's fully leased that, you know, generates returns in perpetuity. So that's what we want. We want an earth-friendly, you know, environmentally friendly, great property. So in due diligence, um, what we do and what many other investment managers do is we run a climate risk report. So there are third party firms. Um, we use coastal risk. There's another service called 427, um, which is bought by Moody's. Um, so I want to say there are three or four others. And what they do is like geospatial climate risk analysis. So you send them the address of the property you're interested in and they send you back a climate risk report. And it tells you across 17 different factors, um, like where does this property fall? How likely is it to um, incur a flood event? Um, how resilient is the community? Has anything happened at this site before in terms of flooding? We're always very, like, very, very concerned about flooding. And so these reports can give you information that you need to make an informed decision. And where you take it from there is also part of your kind of like secret sauce investment formula. So I'll give an example of an apartment building that we're interested in acquiring in Glendale, Arizona. Um, when we ran the climate risk report, we had an unusual finding and um, it was a, a flood hazard, which you just, it doesn't quite make sense why they, that would be. But it turns out Arizona has um, pretty intense summer monsoons, which are like major rain and thunderstorms where there's just an enormous amount of water that falls in a short amount of time. And so there actually is flood risk. Um, there's a very small little river, like half a mile from this property. And it is found that um, it is likely that during the summer monsoons are, you know, this property could indeed be inundated with a foot of water, which is something you would never have known, like from any kind of search you could do or anything like that. Um, you need these um, kind of geospatial climate model um, third parties 
be able to get this kind of information that you need to be able to make a decision. Do you buy it? Do you pass? And so um, climate risk is really on the forefront of all acquisitions teams at this time because um, when you're doing these deals, you need to mitigate as much risk as possible to ensure that you know this will be a healthy investment for you, for your investor, whatever it may be. And so this is now a real wild card because when we think about, you know, we just talked about all the headlines and the storms and the damage, and maybe we want to even throw in like the Texas freeze where um, the grid went down for three or four days. And so like now, how do you feel about Houston? And so you have to ask yourself these questions and every company has to think about um, climate and the effect of a potential investment um, in terms of what the future may hold. And so this is like a very interesting consideration because there, there is really no set path on this. This is a new enough um, area within real estate that people are having to consider like the climate model, the insurance impacts, the effect on returns um, based on what may happen because of climate change. So I find that fascinating. Um, and it's an area of you know, worry and consternation and a real area of impact that is yet to be you know, determined as to how how a firm should consider. Everyone, should, everyone knows they need to consider it. You need the data. And then what do you do with the data? It's what everyone wants to kind of internalize as an investment committee, as an investment group, as to whether you do or not. I find it. I find it. So we we talked about the sea level rising, and so I mean it's a real risk when you're looking at coastal properties. Um, but you have to balance that with like how long am I going to own this property? Um, am I willing to take this risk? What is what is the return? So a lot of markets um, have to deal with flooding um, in different respects. So. We're going to get to the concept of adaptation and mitigation because once you have taken in this information about what your risks are at your property due to the climate, it's not like there's nothing you can do. Um, you, you know, in the case of flooding, you can do some adaptation measures. You can build a flood wall like they're doing in Boston. Um, you know, you're not at a complete loss, which is So I mean, I won't, I won't dwell on this again, but this is just in the U.S. Um, doing the 22 um, major like billion dollar And I think it's worth noting just for a moment that, you know, we're talking about the U.S. quite a bit, but when we look at what's happening there's a term called climate migration. Maybe you've read about it. There's been a lot in the news recently about climate migration, which is really people being displaced. Um, think of people in Somalia, Syria, etc., that literally have to leave their home because there is no way to inhabit it where they have been living. And so climate migration is real, and you know we haven't felt it as much in North America, but um, that could certainly be changing over the next decades. As temperature rise, and GHGs um, continue to create um, unfortunate weather events. So this is just to say that as temperature warms, we already talked a little bit about oceans warming as well, and so they they have a symbiotic relationship and um, you know it causes it causes a lot of extreme weather events. So we mentioned uh, 1.5 degrees uh, C 
the temperature rise. This is the haze of the Paris climate agreement. And when we achieve carbon neutrality, we stay um, below this 1.5 degrees C. But it's worth, I think, a, a few bullet points just to say, like, what what's it, what does it mean? What's the impact of this type of temperature rise? to transfer it to our knowledge of person with a fever, um, if you have 101, uh, and so, you know, taking it out to a more global perspective, um, the temperature rise uh, caused by all what we've been talking about, um, is it can be devastating and disrupt fully disrupt the systems. One of the tools that we talked about adaptation and mitigation. Okay, so I think I started by saying we've been building the same way for about 200 years, literally. Um, you know, the same concepts of, you know, developing the site, framing, um, et cetera, so it's a silver finished building. And we just know so much more now because of engineering practices, construction practices, getting better technology, um, you know, really infiltrating all of our systems to be able to measure and manage um, how we build and how efficient we are. And so construction is finally, Catching up, I would say, in the last 20 years, we talked a little bit about the lead rating system and Fitwell and all of these um, third party kind of policies and practices and verification systems that tell us, you know, these are the strategies. This is how you, you know, build a tight envelope. This is how you should design um, your windows to optimize daylight but minimize thermal heat gain. It is, it's known now, it's not a mystery. Um, and so we have, we have solutions that we can use. All right, so I wanted to make sure we touch on mitigation and adaptation because um, this is one of those things that will pop up in your uh, survey at, at the end. Um, so mitigation is really about actions that reduce emissions or remove them from the atmosphere, whereas Adaptation is the actions that help you adjust. So when you ran when you ran the climate risk report and you found that uh, you had a higher risk of flooding, what adaptation strategies could you put into play to mitigate that? So these are kind of like the two camps, and a lot of the mitigation measures um, they can be done at the site level or they can be done at the city. Um, adaptation measures actually, I would say, um, the same. You can do them at one site, you can do them on a whole scale. Um, so I'll say, you know, one of the things, let's say, you know, we're saying a lot of people are moving to Arizona. Is it a good market to invest in? Uh, you know, the values are going through the roof. Um, it's a hot market, and it is literally a hot market. So, you know, what do we want to think about, you know, in terms of if we ran that risk report on something in Phoenix, we would get, you know, extreme heat, probably 120 days per year or more, over 100 degrees. Um, that's going to cause, you know, a lot of air conditioning, um, energy flow due to that. Um, but then you can also say, like, all right, well, what is Phoenix doing about hygiene? Is this thing actually doing anything? to mitigate or to adapt to the high heat. When the truth is they are. They're undertaking a huge cool city initiative in which they're trying to cool down um, Phoenix. And they're cooling down Phoenix by using, um, you can call it like a white roof, um, cool pavement, tree planting, um, et cetera, where instead of you know, paving or putting down um, dark colored materials that absorb heat and then release them back up into the city, 
they're using these cool and light colored uh, reflective coating, which is going to reduce temperatures across campus. So it's an interesting thing to take into consideration as you're thinking about a, a deal or a market. Um, what is actually happening in the context of these adaptation mitigation measures? What can you do at your site and what's happening at the more like city or county or maybe even statewide scale um, to help you know, combat some of these risks that, that we're all facing? So um, some of the other things that are happening that we, we touched on very briefly, um, as far as the city scale, um, we're definitely seeing stricter energy codes. And I would say that's true um, for states like California as well. Um, so California energy code um, is referred to as Title 24. And it is one of the strictest energy codes in the country. It's really a model for um, other states and other cities. And it's very interesting because we talked about, you know, the lead rating system that gives you um, basically the whole menu of credits and strategies that you would deploy on your project um, to meet their requirements and deliver a green, sustainable building. And that's voluntary, right? You you can do a LEED certification, and there are many LEED buildings on this campus, um, because you want a green building, you think it delivers value for you and your constituents or your investors, your students, or whoever your community is, but it's voluntary. You do it because you're a leader and you want, you want to have that plaque, you want to have that certification, you want to have that bragging right. Um, However, Title 24, um, as the energy company must need to deliver a new building, um, is basically the equivalent of LEED Silver. So in, in case you don't know, LEED has kind of different levels. So you can be certified, silver, gold, platinum, um, you know, in terms of all the credits you receive. So when the state building code is equivalent to LEED Silver certification, it's basically taking, you know, a voluntary standard and inserting it into the code. And so it's a very interesting thing to watch because the energy code updates at a regular interval. And every time it updates, it gets more strict. It never gets less strict. Um, and you'll find that, you know, the lead rating system gets more ambitious every couple of years. And then the code gets more ambitious. And it reflects the grading system. And so in California, this there's kind of this endless cycle um, of requirements, new requirements um, that are sometimes more expensive, but are instituted because they show um, increase for energy efficiency, water conservation, and all the things that we want. Um, but the, the energy codes and building codes are totally different across the country. Um, because states are different, there are places that have um, federal preemption, and so every single place or every single market or geography that you seek to build um, will have a different set of standards. So uh, it's just an interesting thing to look into as you look at different markets and consider, you know, where where you want to build by. And um, we talked a little bit about the price or cap on carbon. That's what that local law 97 in New York is really establishing. And um, you're seeing other cities develop their own laws just like that. So um, they're popping up in Washington, D.C. Um, building performance standards are in St. Louis, Missouri. They're in Boston. And so you can imagine um, cities generally uh, model their codes or states model their codes after others that are already in the market. And so you can imagine the proliferation over the next couple of years of, you know, maybe 20, 20 more cities that will enact these building performance standards that are essentially the price, putting a price on carbon. Because when you exceed 
your limit is from 5 to 10. So these adaptations um, are certainly site specific. So these are some examples of what you could do um, in the face of different um, climate stressors. So you can install stronger windows if you're um, in a severe wind area um, or experiencing storms that are regular wave. You can literally raise up your building. Um, you'll see this in Florida, you'll see this in different areas in the south, um, island communities where sometimes the best adaptation is to literally you know, put the building on stilts and move your equipment from the basement to the roof. Um, it sounds kind of rudimentary, but um, it, it literally is an adaptation strategy. Um, the second one is interesting backup power and drinking water um, for multifamily buildings. And you know, this I think really made its way into like the public thinking after different major disasters like Sandy, where power was out for you know extended periods of time. And so now I think as sustainability professionals, as developers, it's like they don't want that, you know, backup battery, maybe it's worth the price of, you know, installing a backup battery so that when the power goes down, um, let's say you're in Northern California and, you know, they do the power safety shutoffs anytime there's a high wind because they don't want to be held liable for um, sparking a wildfire from their energy uh, distribution lines. Like maybe that's something you need to consider for building a new building in that area. So um, there's a lot of strategies that can help us kind of uh, face the different threats that we may face depending on where we are. Solutions that are be scale. <laughs> and so I guess it's fitting since today is, is Earth Day, um, just to look, you know, into the past. So I think this is the 50, First or 52nd birthday ever. Um, and it really actually started um, because people were reacting to environmental disasters. Um, Earth Day actually originated out of Santa Barbara. Um, but the picture that we're looking at is a river that literally caught on fire because of all the pollutants, flammable pollutants that had been dumped into the river by different manufacturing and, and industries along the river. Um, so that's you know, that's a that's a real wake up call um, when we're living here. So these these kinds of moments really spark um, individuals and, and private activists to get involved, stand up, and you know call for a better plan. In the seventies, actually under Republican under Nixon, um, we got the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And so um, these actually were an important turning point in environmental policy um, in the United States to really, you know, limit um, pollution by by heavy industry. Um, there was an acid rain program um, that came into effect, um, but also actually worked um, in. You know, reducing these sulfur dioxide emissions that were literally dropping as it rain onto people, cars, and agriculture uh, as it was being dropped in the atmosphere and uh, transferred down. In the 80s, we have the um, momentum to solve the, the hole in the window. Um, I mean, this is just a, a huge. Uh, international movement to solve this because um, it was just creating all kinds of all kinds of problems basically due to these hydro fluorocarbons from aerosols and so people banded together um, and you know transitioned out from those recruiters so you know we don't want to be all doom and gloom today but um, everything is you know on fire and, and flooding and 
there's nothing new to do. We talked about some uh, solutions, and I'm sure the people in this room, the people in this school are working on all kinds of you know other solutions that will come into play, like um, carbon capture and storage, or just the idea that you can actually you know draw down carbon from the air and inject it. Um, they've created like concrete solutions that can accept carbon dioxide and then are actually stronger because of that. So there's there's a lot of um, really great technologies coming our way. Um, <coughs> pretty rapid growth. So um, we won't dwell on what the law might be said at the end, but it's just worth um, talking about that it is one way that cities and governments you know, really start to act on the Paris Climate Agreement and draw down emissions to zero by 2020. And so we just have actually a few slides left. Um, I wanted to take a moment to talk about um, environmental justice because um, it's important. I think that all of us in the real estate community think about the communities in which we work and develop property because um, no building is in isolation. Each building, you know, is connected to its network of people that use it, the other buildings around it, the cities in which it exists, and the people moving through. And so, you know, it's been interesting during COVID to look at, like, even downtown LA or any of you are from other big cities and we you know we walked through and, and felt the feeling of you know there's no there's there's no there was no this is the word there was no culture to be had there was no you know lunch cafe that was open the night food that was you know and, and we're all part of these kind of ecosystems and networks of communities and it's important to realize that you know across the decades, um, communities have not all benefited um, because of their location. And LA is a perfect example of that. I don't know if you have the opportunity to drive through South LA, East LA, um, San Pedro, other areas near the port, and you realize, like, this doesn't look like West LA. You're like, West LA, like, we're fortunate here to have like great weather, mature trees, transit that can get me from A to B, uh, you know, class A buildings, not, not tremendously poor air quality. And then you can go like five, four miles east of us and be in a concrete, like barren wasteland. Um, and it's true. You can find that in many cities, but it's very cheap um, here in LA. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, equity and environmental justice. So, that way. so it is true that disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities um, have borne the greatest environmental burdens. Um, if you want to consider redlining in LA, um, want to consider, you know, where are the neighborhoods that were divided when we planned out the freeway system? I mean, it goes on and on. It's the same neighborhoods that have been disinvested in for a long time. Um, I feel like there's a shift. Um, I feel like there's more investment going to these communities now. This is where, you know, the real estate industry can help and gentrification is a very tricky word because gentrification can also mean displacement of people that are already there that can no longer afford to live there with new amenities, new buildings, um, new transit comes in. So it's a tricky balance, but I think working you know, with communities to deliver products that benefit the community. Um, are the conversations that we all want to have to really see, you know, our cities and our communities uh, environmentally and socially. Yeah. 
So I don't have to tell you that I, you know, African Americans have been exposed to more pollution um, based on just their zip code. Um, this is true, you know, throughout the United States and so adverse health impacts. And this has been going on for decades. I believe you'll get a question later about environmental justice. Um, so, you know, environmental injustice is when groups are excluded, they, their power is taken away from the planning process or the zoning process. Um, environmental justice is including communities, letting them have a seat at the table to discuss things that are important to them and how they want to see their community change. So um, truly the definition is fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people in the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. So everybody gets to have a say in what will come to affect their own. I think we'll end it there. We'll play up time if there's any questions or discussion that you guys want to have. But I hope, I hope you enjoyed your first day of the lecture on sustainability. <laughs> and that was really nice to meet you guys. And if I can ever help you in any way, I was happy to 